Hello and welcome to this episode of the Geoeconomic Agenda, a podcast from the Institute of Geoeconomics at the Asia Pacific Initiative in Tokyo that investigates the connections between economics, politics, business, and society. I'm your host, Paul Neto, and I'm a visiting researcher here at the IOG. So today I'm sitting down with Dr. Jagannath Panda. He's the head of Stockholm Center for South Asian and Indo-Pacific Affairs and a professor at the University of Warsaw. And we're going to talk about India's perspectives on the U.S. election. Dr. Pandas, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. So this is the second of a series that we're doing here at the Geoeconomic Agenda that looks at different perspectives from different countries in the Indo-Pacific region on the U.S. election. Last time we talked to Jared Monshine of the United States Studies Center at the University of Australia, excuse me, at the University of Sydney about Australia's perspective on this. And he had the interesting point that Australians are almost following U.S. politics more than they are their own elections. So I'll ask uh, if that applies to India. Are, how much are Indians paying attention to this? I know there's an election going on now even as we speak, but how much of this is a topic of interest among decision makers, among the general public? What's the what's the view? I think politics in general is very interesting, and uh, I think uh, Indian people, given the you know rising space and uh, rising space of Indian public, getting more and more internationally oriented and becoming more educated, so they have started following elections in other countries beyond India, and mm-hmm. particularly elections in other part of the world becomes attractive when India has a grand, you know player of elections currently, which is mm-hmm. continuing almost nearly for two months. So yeah. that itself is an attractive motivation for mm-hmm. Indian people to follow elections in other parts of the world, not only within India, but also uh, the in the countries um, which draws attention and probably there is no better country in the world than the United States of America, which uh, is in a, a, in a way a critical partner for India in the world politics, mm-hmm. in the world affairs. And also, most importantly, it is a critical security partner for US, for, for mm-hmm. India in the Indo-Pacific regions. So keeping all of this thing in mind, I am sure that India is observing each and every political development in the US mm-hmm. closely, particularly the American president elections. And mm-hmm. Indian people uh, are very acu- acumous, uh, you know, uh, Indian people are very used to following the American television channels, uh, newspapers uh, like New York Times and all. So that gives an impression that uh, India is very keenly following the elections and political developments in the U.S. Hmm. So with that in mind, as we you know start to turn towards what India's hopes and concerns might be for the outcome of the U.S. election, can you just provide a certain kind of you know, stock taking of where U.S.-India economic relations are right now. What's the picture like? Well, when it comes to the economic ties, I think uh, U.S. is undoubtedly a critical uh, economic partner for India. I, I mm-hmm. think there is a lot of discussion going on how to really make the trade contacts going to the next level, particularly bringing trade contacts closer to the um, areas where Um, You know, there are many gray areas where economic contacts has not really been discussed, particularly in the defense trade economics, Hmm. particularly in the science and technological domain of the trade and economics uh, partnerships. And I think these are the two critical areas, defense trade and the Hmm. technological trade are the two aspects where India is very keen to, in order to, you know, expand the trade and economic contacts with the U.S. But while saying that, I think a lot will depend on how the political developments within the U.S., uh, particularly in the party politics, bipartisan Mm -hmm. party politics is emerging. What we have seen over the last at least uh, five, seven years, if not one decade, is that there is a bipartisan bipartisan consensus within the U.S. to Mm -hmm. see India as a preferential, as well as a key trade, economic, and security partner in in, in Indo-Pacific. So mm-hmm. India is definitely taken much more seriously in the U.S. administration, be mm-hmm. it in the Republican administration, be it in the Democratic administration. And that has created a lot of positivity mm-hmm. in the Indian domestic strategic circuit. 
particularly in the industrial sector, particularly in the private sectors. Um, and of course, Indian government is equally serious about taking the India-US trade and economic contacts to the next level. So mm -hmm. this trade and economic contacts with the US becomes much, much more important at a time when we are just recovering from a, from a post-pandemic world economic mm -hmm. slowdown. And mm -hmm. particularly at a time when US is emerging as a critical supply chain network partner for India in the Indo-Pacific regions. And also given India's a difficulty in terms of trade and economic contacts with China, particularly the way China has behaved with India on the boundary dispute to the regional security issues. Keeping all of those things in mind, the trade and economic contacts with the US is going to be one of the most important and challenging aspect of the relationship. Should it continue and evolve to the next level? I mm -hmm. think India-US relationship will evolve to the next level to become it as a uh, you know, key Indo-Pacific partnership uh, in the regions uh, in, in in the times to come. Hmm. So, what what's holding back the that relationship? Because if I were to ask that question in, or a similar question in Tokyo, you know, there you'd get sort of an eye roll or a grumble about you know Trans-Pacific partnership or a lack of market access. So, in India's case. What are the barriers holding back the U.S.-India economic relationship from reaching a, a more fuller form? Is it a question of liberalization? Is it just a question of investment? Is it regulatory? Is it D, all of the above? And what's, what's your take? I think there are both international factors and domestic factors, and we have to understand it both in uh, India a U.S. domestic context, as well as in the international context. In the international context, I think generally what we are noticing that U.S. administration or U.S. foreign policy frameworks when it comes to trade and economic dealings are mm -hmm. becoming much more transactional and business oriented, mm -hmm. uh, much more demanding. Be it mm -hmm. the Trump, of course, we saw during the Trump administration that he was quite transactional, he was quite demanding. But yeah. there is not much also in the Biden administration. Even the Biden does not really look that hawkish. Biden administration yeah. does not really look that aggressive on the trade negotiation mm -hmm. front. But still, in general, the U.S. foreign policy has become much, much more transactional when it comes to trade and economic dealings. Um, uh, also, the other aspect is that how U.S. is positioning itself more as a kind of trade uh, uh, leader rather mm -hmm. than as a trade uh, protection uh, protectionist bearer. Uh, for example, if you see, one of the key aspects of both the Trump administration and the Biden administration is that how to really make the global trade rules to become much more reformist oriented, mm -hmm. uh, particularly within the WTO. Uh, mm -hmm. But that is not really in the interest of the developing countries, that is keeping in the interest of the developed world, particularly the the West, particularly the US and the European community in perspective. But the time has come, I think, uh, to talk with a country like India, mm -hmm. which has a lot of demands within the WTO norms to reform the global trade, uh, you know, rules and regulations. That would allow um, as, a, as a, gra a greater international platform between US and India to talk about much more closely about trade and economic partnership, particularly mm -hmm. at a time when US is not a part of the you know, CPTPP, and mm -hmm. um, there is a new negotiation of a platform of negotiation, Ajemas, that is the Indo Pacific, uh, you know, economic framework. So, mm -hmm. keeping all of this thing in mind, it, it makes sense that US and India talks more on the international platforms, how to really make the trade and economic negotiation as a much flexible medium of exchange of opinions and exchange of, you know, co collaborations. That will mm -hmm. help. Uh, to solidify the relationship. When we mm -hmm. look at the domestic barriers, I think mm -hmm. there are both barriers in the United States of America and also in the Indian context. In the Indian context, particularly, there are barriers like the trade rules, regulations, and the domestic laws, which really puts a check on the foreign companies to come abruptly and just you know start the business. That is mm -hmm. not going to be a, a, a easy exercise. It has not really been easy exercise for the foreign companies um, in past. And mm -hmm. also in today's context, there is a lot of barriers one has to really go through. So the administrative difficulties, administrative laws and regulations always is a challenge in the Indian domestic context that many of the American companies face. 
um, not only the American American companies, but also companies from Japan, South Korea, from the East mm-hmm. Asian economies, they also equally face the same kind of um, you know administrative barriers. But when mm-hmm. it comes to also other barriers, I think uh, given India's tough um, federal system, uh, where there is a central government and there are different uh, state governments, right. it is difficult to also uh, create that kind of administrative convenience for the foreign companies to come and invest. So American companies face that difficulties. When we try to understand the same thing from the US point of view, from the domestic point of view, I think there are also US companies who find it's much more easier to invest and work in Japan, in South Korea, in Southeast Asian countries, rather than investing in India because of the India's uh, top federal system. And also the US companies and corporate houses, corporate giants, they have a much more unique way of approaching of working in a much more transparent manner. Mm. Uh, that Indian uh, domestic uh, atmosphere does not necessarily encourage for. Uh, mm-hmm. Because in India, there are a lot of red tepism, a lot of, uh, you know, administrative difficulties where you have to please some of the local politicians to get the project done. Um, and also you have to reach, uh, have a good reach with the central government to mm-hmm. make your file move to the next level. So I think these are some of the domestic difficulties and the domestic uh, factors that both sides has to um, address in order to take <laughs> forward the trade and economic ties to the next level. So with all that in mind, I'll ask maybe a sensitive question and ask, would India prefer to see elected? Is there a rooting interest among, say, foreign policy, economic elites? Is there a rooting interest among the business community, the Indian public? And does anyone sort of secretly wish for one guy to come out on top? I think it is difficult for India to really take a position the way Mm -hmm. Trump has previously behaved. If he comes back, hypothetically Mm -hmm. speaking, if he comes back, then India has to again prepare to face a uh, more hawkish uh, Trump again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not only India, but the whole world. Um, Mm -hmm. And given the way India's relationship with with the Democrats have evolved, particularly uh, under the Biden administration, um, India would also welcome a continuity. So Mm -hmm. either the Republicans or the Democrats coming to power, it hardly matters because there is a bipartisan consensus in the US to see Mm -hmm. India as a uh, as a preferential partner, as a key partner in Indo-Pacific regions, and that makes India to, um, you know, become a, a you know, k- kind of a confident uh, a partner for the US uh, at a at a bilateral as, as well as at a at a regional level. But mm-hmm. for India, what is the most significant point here is I think two issues will decide who India would like to see and how India would like to go with the future administration. One is the. Uh, the the trade issues, as I mentioned, that um, whether under the if Trump is making a comeback, whether Trump is uh, becoming much more flexible than his first term uh, mm-hmm. that he ruled before Biden won the election, and I think if Trump is really flexible, then India would like to see Trump's administration coming back. But given the experience of Trump um, 1.0 when he was in power earlier. He was not a easy going president. He was much more tough. He mm. he demanded about you know border sharing. He demanded on the tough negotiation deal on the trade and economic uh, ties. So therefore, I think a lot will depend uh, how the trade and economic ties will be seen in times to come, both with the Trump administration and uh, by, by the Biden administration. The second issue is I think the China issue how the Biden administration and the Trump administration is going to look at the China issue. I mean, it is it is very clear that probably for the first time in the history, in the last few years, both India and US are standing on the same side, if not on the same point um, on the China issue. On the same side on the China issue, because both for the first time, exclusively seeing China as a uh, threat for the future, for their security mm-hmm. bearings, for the liberal international order. So they are on the same side. But when it comes mm-hmm. to critical issues like Taiwan issue on the South China Sea issue, on the boundary dispute with China, uh, there has to be an agreement on the China threat uh, mm-hmm. by the US and India on the on some of these range of issues. So a lot of will depend 
how the Biden administration or Trump administration look at this specific issue. But if I uh, look holistically, probably mm -hmm. at this moment, India would like the Biden administration to continue um, mm -hmm. in power because there is a momentum has been built. But again, India would also welcome a Trump change in the US in the US government with a with a, with a Trump coming back to power because if we remember uh, between Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Trump, there has been a key chemistry um, in terms of addressing bigger mm -hmm. platforms, bigger people, uh, which was not really possible for Modi administration or Prime Minister Modi to create that kind of platform um, with the Biden administration and with the President Biden. In fact, mm -hmm. if you recall, when PM Modi came to power, he actually traveled to US to address yes. big rallies with President Trump. So that kind of personal chemistry is, does exist with President Trump, even though Prime Minister Modi does not have absolute confidence on, on President Trump, given the kind of unpredictability, given the kind of, you know, uh, kind of non-clarity President Trump brings to his foreign policy mm -hmm. because he's much more transitional, you know, transactional, he's much more tough in terms mm -hmm. of negotiation. But Prime Minister Modi might prefer President Trump coming back to power. But in general, I think Indian foreign policy is much more convenient to deal with the Biden administration, mm -hmm. with the Democrat administration, rather than President Trump uh, himself. But, you know, the politics of the game is that leadership matters. And mm -hmm. I think Prime Minister Modi, if he's winning the current Indian election and becoming the prime minister for the third time, then he would pro probably personally prefer Trump coming back to power as the president of the United States of America. So I'm going to ask you to unpack some of your comments about uh, U.S.-India relations vis-a-vis -vis China, because earlier in May, the Biden administration, of course, announced new tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles and a few other items. And I think there's a lot you can take out of that. But one of those things is, quite, I guess my question for you is, can India make the most of I hesitate to call it decoupling, but this realignment in U.S.-China economic relations. Can India position itself to take some of those supply chains, uh, become a base for production? You already talked a little bit about increasing technological trade, but how is India seeing the friction, the trade friction, the economic friction between the United States and China as perhaps an opportunity? I think this is a very critical um, issue, not only for India, but also for the entire gamut of Indo-Pacific countries like South Korea, Japan, and many of the other uh, ASEAN countries. I think a lot will depend not only on the US-China trade negotiation or trade rivalry, but also in general, the competition and the rivalry that is emerging in US and China on different issues like technology, Mm -hmm. to maritime issues, to influence operations and all. So I think uh, each of these issues are going to affect Indian uh, foreign policy outlook as much as it is going to shape and affect the foreign policy outlooks of other countries like Japan and South Korea. Mm -hmm. I think here there are three issues to keep it in mind. One is that I think lately uh, the Xi Jinping administration seems to be slightly flexible and amendable to its foreign policy. So keeping that thing in mind, I think uh, the Xi Jinping administration will watch very closely uh, about the U.S. elections um, uh, in coming months. And mm -hmm. particularly from the Chinese point of view, they would like to see a change in guard in the uh, United States, particularly Trump coming back to power. Even mm -hmm. though the Chinese, they believe that uh, President Trump might be uh, quite hawkish again, he might be quite demanding, he might be tough on China. But he's, the Chinese leaders also knows that Trump is a much more practical-oriented leader, transactional-oriented, mm -hmm. practical-oriented leader. So it is possible to do business with him. It is possible mm -hmm. to do negotiation with him. And the Chinese also know that, you know, uh, President Trump is the president who has also talked to the North Koreans, the North Korean leadership. So President Trump is much more flexible in terms of going that one step uh, ahead breaking the barrier. So mm -hmm. the Chinese are anticipating of an opportunity like this to talk about the critical issues. Uh, so from uh, India's point of view, that is not necessarily a good development 
because hmm. india would like to see a us china relationship should continue as it is uh, there hmm. should be teams there should be non negotiation so that india can negotiate better with the united states of america on trade and economics on the indo pacific security hmm. issues to bilateral defense collaborations and many other issues so therefore that is not necessarily a, a, a significant development but mm-hmm. on the other issues particularly on the indo pacific security issues uh, you know i think india would uh, welcome any change in the us foreign policy uh, particularly us looking at india much more positively and factoring china as a security concern and its security threat um, mm-hmm. there are you know many uh, issues we are now talking with the us between india and us particularly on artificial intelligence space collaborations right. defense and trade economic economics defense ecosystems um and maritime security issues particularly mm-hmm. you know having trilateral quadrilateral forums um trying to have mini little groupings where india and us are taking lead in terms of building indo pacific convergences those are critical issues which are likely to create much more doubts between us and china and the mm-hmm. chinese leadership are not really going to make much compromise on those issues because those are directly going to affect the china's security interest in the indo pacific regions particularly keeping the keeping in mind the way the china's maritime uh, policy is emerging particularly the silk road uh, um, economic belt particularly the maritime silk road projects that xi jinping is trying to you know unfold in the regions so therefore the chinese are witnessing each and every maritime development that is emerging between india and us so mm-hmm. therefore all of these issues are going to be on the negotiation table between us and china when the two leaders have meet maybe after the elections if trump mm-hmm. is coming back to power he would like to talk to the us leadership and xi jinping administration would also negotiate very hard with the trump administration if he is making a comeback in order to not to really lose out any strategic space for china in the indo pacific region hmm. So final question if I can get you on record would you like to make a prediction about what happens in November I I I guess maybe uh, president Trump has a fair chance of coming back to power mm-hmm. uh, the way the politics is emerging and the way I think uh, the Biden administration is currently functioning it does not really look all that impressive and mm-hmm. I think uh, we know for a fact um, when president Trump had won the elections uh five you know 10 years back he mm-hmm. actually surprised many coming back from from nowhere to win mm-hmm. the elections mm-hmm. so i think there is a very high chance that he might be uh, reelected but again it is anybody's guess um, and i think we are still having a good 6 months time to the election 6 or 7 months and 6 uh, 7 months is a big time in the us politics in any country's politics domestic yeah. politics and but my guess is probably Trump is going to probably make a comeback in the US election. Okay. Dr. Jagannath Panda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Paul. This is the Geoeconomics Agenda with Paul Neto. Finally, one of the challenges to sanctions policy is the ways in which economies adjust their behavior to make up for the shortfalls of resources, finding substitute products or figuring out how to make meager resources stretch farther. In fact, it's the reason Nutella, the chocolate hazelnut spread, was invented. The first step in the process was the Napoleonic Wars, and specifically the French Empire's continental system, which prohibited the territories in the empire from trade with Great Britain. But because the British Empire was Europe's main source for chocolate, this meant that much of Europe experienced a chocolate shortage. For Italians, the solution was to dilute their limited chocolate supply with the hazelnuts, which grew plentifully in the area, inventing a thick paste called gianduia. which was an early precursor to Nutella. But once the French Empire collapsed and the continental system dissolved with it, chocolate was once again accessible, consumers went back to their old ways, and Gianduia was mostly forgotten. The next step in the process was World War II, which again led to a shortage of chocolate in Italy. Again, Italians responded by diluting their supply of chocolate by mixing in hazelnuts, but this time, instead of producing a thick paste, Producers made the mix spreadable by adding milk and oil, which helped stretch the limited supply of chocolate even further, and also had the added benefit of making it more affordable for consumers for whom chocolate had been a luxury that was out of reach. This time the product, eventually called Nutella, was a success and has stuck around long after the end of World War II.
That's all for this episode, but stay tuned for more on the way. Until then, we want to talk about what you want to hear about as well as take your questions for our show. So send us an email at geoeconomicagenda at ihj.global. Be sure to like, rate, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts, tell your friends, and most of all, keep listening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to the team at API for making this happen, and we'll talk to you next time.